E News. And now on BBC Radio 4, it's time for Case Notes with Dr. Mark Porter. This week, dizziness and vertigo, all too common symptoms caused by glitches in the body's balance system. The sensation for me personally was like if you was in an office chair and you were spun around fast and then you stood up, that dizzy effect was pretty much what I would have. The attacks would last sometimes a couple of days. The sensation was just not going away. I kept trying to go into work and within an hour I would be at my desk in tears because of that swimming sensation. Frightening, disorientating, even dangerous. By late middle age, around one in three of us will have experienced some degree of vertigo due to a problem with our balance mechanism or vestibular system located in the inner ear. It's even more common in the elderly, for whom the resulting falls can lead to broken hips and other life-threatening injuries. To find out more about vertigo, I spent the day with the team from the One Stop Balance Clinic at Guy's Hospital in London. April, welcome to the Balance Clinic. Thank you. I'll just explain what's going to happen. My name's Gareth, I'm one of the physiotherapists here. Yes. And the Balance Clinic's made up of myself, I'm from the physios. Mm-hmm. We've got an audiologist, Prasanna, who you'll meet in a minute. Yes. And we're going to get a full assessment done today for you from you. me and Prasanna. Mm-hmm. Um, what will normally happen is we'll get the assessment done, you go home, and then next week we'll present the findings of the assessment to the third member of the team is one of the ENT consultants with a special interest in balance, Mr Kenny Gonkar, Mm -hmm. and we'll make a clinical diagnosis. The Balance Clinic is a new approach to tackling an age-old problem, but it's not a service you're likely to find at every local hospital. Rahul Kenny Gonkar is one of the ear, nose and throat surgeons heading up the multidisciplinary team at Guy's. There are a few other one-stop clinics around the UK. (laughs) Yes, but unfortunately there there are very few. Our setup is slightly different in so far as we have patients initially assessed by a vestibular physiotherapist trained to a very high standard and they can pick out uh, the clinical signs involved as well as take a more than adequate history and our patients then have all their testing performed and then we let them go home and then we can discuss all our patients in the balance clinic. And you'd sit down together as a group, decide on what's appropriate. Now, presumably, some of those patients won't need to come back. You can contact their clinicians that are looking after them, their GP. Some will. Um, and you would call them back and then see them yourself, perhaps? That's correct. If there are any red flags, um, if we're unable to establish a diagnosis... And by a red um, flag, you mean something that suggests something a little bit more complicated? Correct. Right? Something sinister or untoward. Then I would always see them myself as well. And presumably the fact that the patients don't always have to see the consultant makes the clinic quite efficient as well. It is a very efficient way of managing patients, not only in in terms of how quickly they're seen, but also how quickly they're tested. Ordinarily in an ENT clinic, if you felt that a patient needed their vestibular function testing performed, you would have to write a letter to the audiology department. Then the patient would be seen. That process may take several weeks. Thereafter, there'll be a several week delay in terms of seeing the patient again in your clinic with the results and then deciding what to do with them. And by and large, if you then felt it was appropriate for the patient to have vestibular physiotherapy, then again, you'd have to refer those patients on. Any questions so far? No. Okay, so my part of the assessment will be, I'm going to have a brief look at your history again. I know we've got some of that already. Uh, First to be assessed this morning by vestibular physiotherapist Gareth Jones is 70-year-old April Matthews. Just under a year ago at a Pilates class, I fell over after doing a forward bend. The room just sort of turned around, just went upside down, turned around, felt felt very unwell. I was violently sick, I was physically sick. And how is it now? It comes and goes. I came to the balance clinic here at Guy's a few months ago, which made me feel a lot better but it has gradually come back when do you notice it when i turn over in bed getting out of bed during yoga classes i have to be very careful i'm from a lying down position and standing up so it's changes in posture that yes you're, you're noticing when yes you're it is yes yes there are lots of causes of vertigo ranging from a temporary side effect of excess alcohol to much rarer but more sinister conditions like brain tumors 
Whatever the underlying problem, the net effect is the same. To cause vertigo, it must interfere with one of the three senses that the body uses to maintain balance, or the part of the brain that they report to. Rahul Kanigonka. The three sensory inputs are your vision, which accounts for about 70% of your sense of balance, because it defines the horizon, tells you how far you're off the ground, tells you what you're doing in relation to your environment. 15% or thereabouts comes from your inner ears, the balance organs, and there's one set in each ear. And the third sensory input is your skin and your joints. So information is being relayed to your brain all the time from these three different sensory inputs. And it's integrated and interpreted centrally. And what I really mean by that is that in your brain, you've got a big filing cabinet full of templates for what your sense of balance ought to be doing for a particular environment, for a particular movement, where your centre of gravity ought to be for a particular position that you're in. And your brain is cross-referencing the sensory information that's presented to it with those templates. And if there's a mismatch of information or the two don't tally, that's when you become dizzy. And, and these templates, are, are they learnt? I mean, I, I'm thinking things like riding at the skills required to ride a bike, for instance. You're absolutely right. They are learnt, and they're learnt over your entire life. So if, for example, one of your inner ears stops working for whatever reason, then you can imagine the templates that you've built up over your life now no longer tally with the information that's presented to the brain. And that causes dizziness and vertigo. April, have a look, a quick look at your balance. Mm. I'm going to go into the middle of the room, if that's OK. You can leave your shoes on, that'll be fine. Yeah. Um, put your feet together. Can you fold your arms? Can you fold your arms? That's fine. And what are you like there? Are you going to fall over? Don't think so. Feel steady? Mm, yes. Good. Right, a little bit harder. Can you shut your eyes now? Keep your balance. <laughs> So a bit more sway is normal here. Is it? Yeah. It is. And that's presumably because you're, when you shut your eyes, you're losing the input from the eyes to give you your position. So you're purely yeah. dependent on your balance yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So the inner ear and all the other oh. sensations in your, in your joints, yeah. your arms yeah. and legs and stuff. Ooh. It feel funny? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. You but are wobbling a bit. Very, yeah. Mm. I've done these sorts of postures in yoga for a long time sure. on one leg and one up, and I've always been able to do it, but I can't do it now. April's initial assessment suggests she probably has a problem in her inner ear, where we all have a series of balance sensors situated in a structure known as the labyrinth. Gavin Morrison is another surgeon at Guy's and St Thomas's with a special interest in balance disorders. It's like a number of caves all joined together, and that labyrinth is made up of the cochlea, which is the shell-shaped organ of hearing, in the front, and then further back are the semicircular canals. There are three on each side and what we call the static labyrinth, which comprises two fluid-filled compartments, the utricle and the saccule. They work in different ways. The utricle and the saccule have special vestibular or balance receptor hair cells with little calcium particles stuck on the top of the hairs. And when our head tips or our body changes position, gravity pulls on the hairs, just like the wind might blow the, the branches of a tree, uh, and that stimulates the nerve cells and tells us that our head is in a certain position. The semicircular canals do something rather different. They respond to what we would call angular acceleration. If we go round the corner in the car or we turn our head quickly, then there's a slight lag of the fluid in the semicircular canal because of inertia, and then it later on catches up and moves. So this deflects a different type of receptor, which is called the cupula, which is a little bit like a paddle in the inner ear. And deflection of the paddle will stimulate a different balance nerve, which tells us that we're going round a corner. So it responds to acceleration rather than position. Hello, April. I'm Prisana, audiologist involved in the balance clinic. Hello. Gareth has seen you previously to do uh, an assessment of your general balance and I, yes. now I'm, I'm going to look at your eye movements particularly I by see. putting some goggles over your eyes and uh, looking to see how your eyes move with some certain tests that I'm going to perform. Right. Okay. First of all I need to put the goggles on. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm putting some goggles that I've got a, an infrared camera over one of the eyes. 
So these are like a big pair of ski goggles. Yes. One side of which is blanked off, and that's your infrared camera. That's correct, yes. And that does what? That tracks the movements of the eye itself? Uh, yes, the, the camera itself focuses on the pupil. Eyes open, please. That's great. Earlier, we've had to take off the mascara, actually. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise, the, the camera gets confused between the pupil and the eyelashes, which doesn't help. And we've got an image of April's eye up on your screen here. So. That's correct. Brilliant. What I'd like you to do now, please, is to turn yourself around. So that if the you... eyes are the windows to the soul, then eye movements are the windows to the workings of the inner ear, thanks to something called the vestibular ocular reflex. When everything's working normally, this reflex helps stabilise vision. So when the balance sensors detect that your head is moving to the right, your eyes move left to compensate. When they sense that your head is tilting forwards, the reflex raises your eyes. But when the system isn't working properly, typically because of spurious messages from the inner ear, that same reflex can cause abnormal eye movements known as nystagmus. A flicking of the eyes, a bit like that seen in people looking at passing scenery out of the window of a speeding train. In the balance clinic, April is being asked to perform various tasks to see if they cause nystagmus and help Gareth and Prasanna work out what is causing her vertigo. What we're going to be doing next April is we're, we're going to be uh, lying you flat yeah. and uh, look to see if we can provoke any dizziness. Uh, this is called the, the Hallpike test yes. and uh, a view of your, your symptoms of your dizziness lasting for, for less than a minute, quite often we find that the test, this test is a, is a positive result. So what we're going to do is first of all ask you just to sit yourself up so that we can lie the couch down. Well, keep yourself sitting up. Now, I've noticed you've got a little sick bowl on the end there, so yeah. you are suspecting this may well yeah. bring on the symptoms. Well, in view of what April was saying earlier in terms yeah. of how dizzy she was and how ill she became in the first instance, we do need to be uh, cautious and be prepared. So, yeah. And this is why you're doing this test last as well? Isn't yes, it? that's right. So we've got the cameras over the eyes, we've covered up both the eyes, and we're going to be recording the eye movements when we lie April down. So what we're going to do is, April, we're going to turn your head to the left, 45 degrees, mm -hmm. and then we're going to lie down quite quickly. It's very important that you keep your eyes open so that we can record your eye movements. Lay down for about half a minute and then bring your head up. So. You feel yeah. awful? Yeah. All right? Yeah. Open your eyes, shout on screen, do whatever okay. you need to. Yeah. If you want to get up, we can get these goggles off yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Yeah, yeah. If you can, keep your eyes open. You okay. feel dizzy. Yeah, okay. All right? Yeah. Great. Right. On the count of three, we'll, we'll take yeah. you down. So three, two, one, one go. Lie down. down, I've got you. Ooh. Eyes wide open. And we're looking at the eye movements to see if there's any movements of the eyes. Yes, yes. We, are, we are now actually seeing this characteristic clicking movements that are associated with uh, a positive four pike test. Hey, April, how are you feeling? Uh, a bit giddy. A bit giddy. <laughs> yeah. This eye movement didn't come on straight away, and now we're looking to see how long this eye movement called nystagmus lasts for. And that was for about 20 seconds. Is it gone? Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, fine. So this characteristic picture that you see here tells you that April has, has got what? It tells us that she's got a, a condition called uh, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, or BPPV. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is the commonest cause of vertigo in pretty much all age groups in this country. And it's a condition where part of the calcium plate from the utricle, it becomes detached and it falls into the lowest part of the inner ear, which is usually the posterior semicircular canal. And patients classically wake up in the morning, roll to get out of bed, and this debris slides and hits the paddle that picks up movement within this semicircular canal, and it produces an awful spinning sensation. Now, in view of the fact that we've actually brought on uh, the dizzy symptoms and that I've actually seen the eye movements characteristic mm -hmm. of uh, a positive test, we're now going to move on to, to treating April's uh, dizziness by doing what's called the Epley manoeuvre. Back in the assessment here, room, audiologist Prasanna and physiotherapist Gareth 
are going to try and treat April using a series of head movements known as the Epley manoeuvre. So April's head's in the, the first position with the head back 45 degrees to the left. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move the head uh, 45 degrees towards uh, the, the right. The manoeuvre is made up of a sequence of four different positions, held for 30 seconds at a time, and designed to move that bit of debris in her semicircular canal into a cul-de-sac where it won't cause problems in the future. April, do you feel dizzy at all at this particular stage? Excellent, right. It's a bit like one of those handheld games where you have to tilt the puzzle to get the ball bearing into the hole. Only it's easier and it can be very effective. Rahul Kenny Gonka. That is curative in our hands in the majority of cases. So, which begs the question, I mean, there must be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people out there who get intermittent attacks, dizziness, who are put on drugs in general practice. That seems to be the main first-line management. Yes, and, and by and large, drugs are not required. There's really no benefit for this condition. But epi manoeuvre is something that could be done in the community quite easily. It can be. But it, I, I suspect it's not being done anywhere near as often as it should be. It's, it's quite frightening for the patients. Um, they often need an escort home and they certainly can't drive home afterwards. Um, and very, very occasionally they are so unwell that they will vomit in the clinic. So understandably clinicians are a little apprehensive. But in April's case, it seems to have done the trick without recourse to the sick bowl. When she's put through the same movement which triggered her vertigo earlier, all seems well. Are you not feeling any dizziness at all? No, I feel, okay. no, feel, feel alright, yeah. Fascinating, isn't it, don't you think? Yeah. Great. Pleased for them that it worked, aren't you? Yeah. The first time when Jerry did it, it was just cool to do that. I told everybody about it. So, for BPPV, drugs that dampen feedback from the inner ear to ease vertigo, so-called vestibular sedatives, aren't always necessary. But there are other balance disorders where they're about the only thing that can provide relief at least in the short term. The commonest is labyrinthitis. That's a situation where one inner ear simply stops working. There's an abrupt cessation of function in that inner ear. And classically, it's been put down to a viral infection that seems to affect one inner ear. And as a result of that, patients tend to wake up and the room just will not stop spinning for them. And it's very frightening. They suffer from nausea, they vomit. And those patients then require stematil, prochlorperazine, which is a vestibular sedative. So it reduces the amount of information presented to the brain from the inner ears. Usually, people with labyrinthitis start to improve within a few days as their brains begin to compensate by adjusting to having one set of balance organs out of action and increasing the priority given to information from the other side and from the other senses, particularly the eyes. But in the longer term, this over-dependence on the eyes can lead to another problem, visual vertigo. Visual vertigo is a common consequence of labyrinthitis. As you can imagine, you become more reliant on your vision to stabilise your balance system and your gait. But unfortunately, what that means is, if you take subjects, people with this, into visually rich environments, then they lose their balance. And a classic example is the supermarket, because the floors are patterned with tiles, the ceiling is patterned with tiles, and if you take them down the tins aisle, because there's lots of different size packaging, they get very unsteady and will have to cling on to one of the shelves. So the system literally becomes overwhelmed and then it, it loses control. Absolutely right. I mean, we, we all do this to a certain degree anyway, but um, after an insult to the inner ear, it's, it's just dramatically worse for these people. And that deficit, is there any recovery in function from that side of the ear, or is it just compensation? Well, that's interesting, because some patients, we think, do recover. But for those that don't recover, then physiotherapy exercises are the key. So just try and keep sort of 12 inches to the bar there, Richard. How steady do you feel? <laughs> is it challenging? <laughs> to be honest, yeah. So here we are in the physiotherapy gym. This is where uh, the patients who have been assessed in the balance clinic in the ENT department come for the rehabilitation. Jeremy Corcoran is another of the vestibular physiotherapists at the balance clinic. There's 
bits of quite standard gym equipment around the room. So we have an exercise bike, a step machine, got some gym balls. As you can see, it's dimly lit. That's partly because we want to challenge our patients. We want them to be in scenarios that they find difficult for their dizziness or their stability. Because after all, we need a challenge to progress rehabilitation. Away from the treadmill and exercising patients, Jeremy explained how physiotherapy can help. We look at what specific problems the patient presents with as opposed to their specific diagnosis. So take, for example, a patient who has distorted signals coming from one ear. They may present with a range of symptoms, be it they're unsteady when they're walking or maybe when they're still but things around them move, they'll feel off and dizzy. So what we try to do is match the exercises to those specific problems. So one rehab strategy for one patient will be different to that for another patient. And the underlying aim, the underlying principle that it's based on is what? That you can teach the brain and ear and balance mechanism new tricks effectively? Exactly that. So different parts of the brain, particularly the coordination part of the brain, recognise when there's distorted signals coming from one ear and they try to recalibrate to those distortions and utilise the distorted signals a little bit better. That usually happens quite well when you're still but there's a whole different ball game when you move. The distortions can then be really unpredictable and, and so often it's the case that people remain dizzy for quite some time after the, the vestibular problem occurred because the brain hasn't got used to the distorted signals during movement. And actually one of the things that we often see as a, as a GP is people who are affected often limit their activities as well and avoid the very things that, that make them worse, which presumably gives the brain even less time to compensate. Exactly that. The brain cannot experience those distorted signals and therefore get used to them. So you're actually going out there and, and aggravating the situation in the short term to make it better in the long term. Yes. Sally Williams had debilitating visual vertigo but it's now one of the gym's success stories. So I did this for about seven weeks and in the beginning I kept thinking how's this going to do anything and then by the end of the seven weeks I was on a chair spinning round and round and round while throwing balls up in the air and having balls thrown at me. So it, it worked and that was just doing an hour here and I think just practising it while you're going about your, your daily duties, you start to, to do what they've taught you to do. And, um, yeah, year or so on, and like I said, I, I've had the odd bout here and there, but nothing like I was getting before. The typical course of vestibular rehabilitation would go on for how long, and how likely is it to be successful? At Guys, we, we generally offer eight sessions of, of rehabilitation, seeing a patient once per week for eight weeks. Bunch them up together so that we can make sustained progress and that there's carryover between the sessions. Up to about 80% of patients recover quite well from that. Unfortunately, for a small minority of patients with vertigo, more drastic treatment may be required. Although over 90% of people with balance problems can be managed with physio and or medicines, surgery may be the only option for the remainder, with everything from intractable BPPV to much rarer problems. Surgeon Gavin Morrison. Patients who have a condition we've become much more aware of probably in the last five to ten years is called a dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal where the bone has eroded over one of the balanced semicircular canals. Which is what happened to Lisa Dunsmuir last year. Really, at the worst of it, the only time I ever felt that I was OK was when I was sort of lying down in my bed with my eyes closed, and that's when everything kind of stopped spinning. But if I got up or if I was moving around or if there was a lot of noise or if there were a lot of people around me, the only way I can kind of describe it is it's this spongy swimming sensation or feeling. The world wasn't spinning, but my head was spinning. What seems to happen is that, for reasons which are not clear in some patients, the bone over the superior semicircular canal, which sits up at the top of the ear bone and is very close to the lining of the brain, the bone can become eroded just by the pressure of the fluid that bathes the brain, pulsating. Once it's eroded, 
This means we have what is termed a third window. In other words, an opening in the bone cover. What seems to happen is the pressure change inside the head, for example, from coughing or straining, will be able to be transmitted to the fluids of the inner ear and can produce movement of the hair cells and make the patient dizzy. Sneezing, coughing, blowing your nose, loud noises would bring on that sensation. I remember sitting in the office and the phones just all around were ringing at one stage and the world, well, I started spinning. Similarly, sound waves can actually be transmitted more easily, can vibrate slightly more easily in the balance part of the inner ear because there is an opening in the balance part. When you have a third window with excessive movement of the fluids, even loud noises will move the hair cells that produce balance and make us dizzy. At the end of it, before sort of the operation, I'd say sort of the whole of December, November, was when I was experiencing it a lot of the time, sort of every single day. The sensation was just not going away. I kept trying to go into work, and within an hour I would be at my desk in tears because of that swimming sensation. And so presumably the, the surgical option in case like this is, is to close that third window. Absolutely right, Mark. There are two ways of going about it, but the operation is to either what we would call resurface the bone to close the window, or to both resurface it and, in fact, to partially plug that window off, plug off that superior canal, because you don't need both superior canals to work absolutely normally to have balance function. And this is what I did with Lisa. Give me some idea of the scale that we're talking about here. I mean, we're talking tiny. Very tiny indeed. The width of the canal would be a millimetre and a half. The length of the opening might be two millimetres, something like that. So it sounds, sounds simple what you're doing, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly complicated. It's, it's that the, the surgery is undertaken with a, an operative microscope going in from above the ear, and we cut a little window in the side of the head above the ear and lift up the lining of the brain over the middle part of the brain to, to access the bone from above. And in cases like Lisa, how quickly before you get to see whether it's worked or not? Interestingly, the patients are much better very quickly, but there is a rather lengthy recovery from the whole operation because it's quite a big operation. But in terms of feeling an improvement in balance and the symptoms of balance, after a few weeks, things would have settled down. Gavin Morrison, ENT surgeon at Guy's and St Thomas's. If you'd like more information on any of the subjects raised today, then do visit our website, bbc.co.uk slash radio4, where you'll find some useful links, including a demonstration of the Epley manoeuvre that works so well for April. Next week's programme is all about patient safety and what the NHS is doing to protect people like you from people like me. Until then, goodbye.